Good afternoon. I'm Damian Ma from the Paulson Institute. Welcome again to uh, uh, the uh, Paulson Institute and Harris Public Policy Contemporary China Speakers Series. If you've attended uh, previous ones, we've covered a gamut of topics, everything from geopolitics of Asia to national security uh, and uh, uh, climate change policy in China. Uh, today, we're going to switch gears a little bit more. Uh, probably one of my favorite topics, which is uh, movies. Uh, being personally a movie buff, I am very delighted that we're uh, talking about uh, China and Hollywood, or Chollywood, if you will. Um, I think uh, it's, it, it's, it's a hugely important story in terms of China's effort to promote its uh, culture, to promote soft power. Uh, it really highlights the intersection of politics and business. And so uh, we couldn't have asked for a better speaker uh, who was nice enough to come back the second time around, uh, who's got a new book out which uh, I don't have to cover here, but you'll, you'll see the cover soon. It's called Hollywood Made in China. And, uh, uh, and, and so we're delighted to welcome uh, Anne, Anne Kokus uh, from the University of Virginia, where she focuses on media studies. But she's currently also working on a very interesting digital data project at the Woodrow Wilson Center in DC. And um, uh, I'm, I'm going to just leave it to her to kind of uh, tell you guys all about uh, what's happening in the movie scene, both in terms of uh, the US-China dynamics, but also what China is doing domestically in terms of uh, really, I, I think, trying to punch really above its weight in terms of uh, investing and financing a lot of movie, movie um, um, production. And it's not a coincidence that if you, you've seen you know, movies like Transformers, you've seen a lot of Chinese product placements. Uh, if you saw the movie Gravity, you noticed that the uh, Sandra Bullock's astronaut comes back on a Chinese spacecraft. Uh, and you may have noticed uh, that Matt Damon sported a ponytail in The Gray Wall. Um, and you know the latest out of China is, of course, Wolf Warrior 2, which, if you haven't seen it, I would uh, recommend seeing it for five bucks on Amazon Prime. Uh, it's, it's an interesting way of looking at what, 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 China, uh, what the image China is, China is trying to project. Uh, uh, and it's more than just the Chinese Rambo. Uh, so all these things are kind of open for discussion. And it's a very fascinating area. And so without further ado, please welcome Anne to, uh, to, to hopefully give a very enlightening talk to all of you. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, how are you everyone? Uh, it is a pleasure to be here today in Chicago in the Midwest. I'm, I'm a Midwesterner by origin, so a February, uh, February weather is, you know, speaks to my heart. I'm very happy to be here. Uh, so I'm really excited to be sharing my research with you today, and especially at the, in a university setting, because a lot of this evolved from experiences that I had when I was a college student. So when I was um, studying uh, Mandarin at Peking University when I was a third year student at University of Michigan, I realized that I needed to you know, get a, find a Chinese roommate in order to improve my Chinese. And I, I happened onto a, a roommate share in the Beijing Film Studio work unit. So at that point, way back in the day, I won't give you the specific year, um, there, at that point, there was still, the film industry was still structured as a state-owned um, as a state-owned entity, and the Beijing Film Studio was attached to the Beijing Film Academy, which was um, attached to the Beijing Film Studio work unit apartments. So all of my neighbors and my roommate were um, people who either had grown up in or were somehow affiliated with the Chinese film industry. So my roommate's grandfather actually was in a movie called Shower, Shizal, uh, and he was one of, and this was a film that was one of the first um, post. Um, post-1949 collaborations between a uh, US producer and a Chinese director uh, that made its way around the, um, the independent film circuit globally. So through that, I started to become really interested in this process. And when I was going to and from school, I would walk through the Beijing Film Studio a lot, kind of seeing these evolutions in, in real time and in, in real life. Um, and then as I was, as I was Going through this process, I realized, OK, this is really interesting, but I need to go home, and I need to get a real job and become a real person. And I became a management consultant. And you know, I was like the realist of the real. And, and it was not as exciting as, as walking through the Beijing film studio on a daily basis, uh, I found. Uh, so I was like, all right, what can I do in order to kind of go back to that, to that world and to that life? 
So I actually received a Chinese government scholarship and studied at the Beijing Film Academy's directing department, much to the chagrin of my parents who were like, oh my gosh, we, we, we worked so hard to bring you to make you this management consultant, and now you're going to China to study directing like Zhang Yimou. What did we do wrong? So. Um, so I had this really wonderful experience of living once again in the Beijing Film Studio, of working in the Film Academy, or uh, studying at the Film Academy, and at that point working for um, the Huayi Brothers, which, was a, which is a Chinese film company, um, as well as working in a variety of different uh, acting jobs and uh, different kind of commercial, commercial experiences uh, as, a, as both on, on camera talent and, and off camera. Um, but when I was talking with my Chinese friends uh, in Beijing, they were like, why are you here in Beijing? You should be, you're American. You should be in Hollywood. You should be in LA. So I decided to move back to the US. I started my PhD at UCLA, and then um, became very interested in looking at these industrial dynamics, these cultural dynamics. Um, and then fortunately, my friends and colleagues from that period of time uh, have been were very kind to allow me to go back and interview them and to discuss these industrial dynamics. So that's how this that's the genesis of this project. So one one thing that I one thing that I always like to kind of urge students to do is when you're thinking through things about experiences, even if they seem kind of crazy, you never know where they may lead you ultimately over the course of your life. Maybe it'll be some something fun and interesting. Um, and I, I feel very very grateful that I had the opportunity to kind of explore those different paths and to be here speaking with you today. Now. What I want to do is kind of start with a, with a backdrop about what, we're, what the current situation is in, in relation to the, the overall theatrical box office between China and Hollywood. So if we see here, the Chinese market has grown, has grown rapidly since 2011. It's actually grown very rapidly since 2001. But this is just kind of for the purposes of seeing the, the shift in terms of the, the relative economic power of the Chinese and North American box office. Um, so if we look here, we'll see this kind of rapid ascent of, of China's box box office and the, the relative plateauing of the US theatrical box office. <laughs> Now this is really significant for um, this is really significant both in terms of the overall value of the the global film market, but also in terms of China's <laughs> relative role and its relative importance within the context of um, of Hollywood studio filmmaking. So if we take a look here, here are kind of three big blockbusters from um, from 2017, and if you if you note films like um, the most recent Transformers, The Fate of the Furious. Uh, and Coco took either more or or roughly the same amount in the Chinese box office as they took in um, in the U.S. box office. So what this means is, for films that are actually able to enter the Chinese market, and I'll talk a little bit more about which films can and cannot, it's essential that they are able to perform well. Um, and this ability to enter the market is also essential in that. Um, there, are, there are competing films that didn't receive permission to be distributed in China and therefore lost out on nearly doubling their potential revenue in, in the US, um, from the US market. So, this is, uh, so in order for something to become a true global blockbuster, it mm -hmm. needs to be able to be released in China and to have a substantial box office outcome there. Now, if you'll note, um, we see that China Whereas um, Japan, India, the United Kingdom are all very important markets, they're very important international markets. When we look at the at the total at the 2016 international market statistics, if you add the next three markets after China, um, they still do not equal that that total that total value for the market. Um, and then also, growth in the global film market is being driven by the um, by the Asia Pacific region, largely China, but also Japan um, and and India. So what this ultimately means is that in order to be able to retain its position as a global as a global film market, Hollywood has to be able to work effectively within within the Chinese market um, and optimally also within other Asian markets as well. So what this means for us is that Hollywood is increasingly made for China. I'll be talking a little bit about the ways in which Hollywood studios are making films in China, but one of but the kind of top line most important takeaway is that regardless of how studios are making their films, they need to take the Chinese market into consideration. Um, and that includes regulatory concerns with regard to Chinese market access. It concerns uh, representational issues with regard to the types of characters and the types of stars and the types of narratives that exist within the films. Um, and it also includes Includes funding issues. So, where does money come from? Who is making money from those films? 
Now, this is already a really important market for, for the US. So US film exports to China were worth over $3 billion in a market um, valued at over $8.4 billion in 2017. Now, that number is actually um, that number is actually constrained. There are some limitations to Hollywood studio access uh, to the Chinese market. One of those is the film import quota. Um, now, this is the result of the US-China film agreement. Um, so that was an agreement from 2012 to, uh, that expired in February, 27, uh, February 2017 that, wa that is currently under renegotiation. Um, and this was for the addition of 34 revenue sharing films to enter the Chinese market. So what that essentially means is 34 films that can be distributed in the Chinese market that um, US companies can take a percentage of the back end distribution box office for. So there are other ways to get film to get foreign films into China. Um, but the revenue sharing import quota is the most is the most lucrative one. So for example, a film like um, a film like Wonder Woman uh, or a film like the most recent Transformers film, because they anticipate such high revenues, that revenue sharing allows for allows for a larger for a greater a greater greater overall profit in the Chinese market. Now there are some smaller films that Chinese distributors can purchase outright, uh, but usually those are at a level of maybe twenty million to sixty million dollars, which would be uh, or even even lower than that. Um, so that is a that is a situation in which it's much less likely that a that a studio film that's a studio film that's at the level of a, a Marvel um, a Marvel comic book movie would be able to recuperate that same high level of that same high level of return. Now this film import quota is still being under negotiation. Technically, it's still um, this 34 film quota is being retained um, as during the negotiation process. There, in 2016, there were more than 34 films let into the market. Um, and it's still very much uh, in progress. So speaking with people at the MPAA, at the US Embassy in China, at the um, US Trade Representative, this is a, a relatively touchy subject in terms of it, the lack of progress. Um, now, some, some have argued that there's really no reason to have the film import quota, uh, and that there can be a, a that the Chinese government can just let in films at a, on a um, piece by piece basis. So we'll, we'll see what ultimately happens with that. But as, as anyone who's looking at the US China relationship knows, there are a lot of um, issues in uh, US China in US China relations that, um, that government officials are dealing with. And the film quota is not necessarily at the top of that list. Um, <laughs> So, so we probably so there will probably be an asterisk next to this for quite some time, if I were guessing. Now, Hollywood needs the Chinese market, as I as I demonstrated, um, the amount of revenue that that studio films can can get from the Chinese market is substantial and growing. Uh, at the same time, the Hollywood Dream Factory and these this kind of technology transfer is supporting the growth of of the Chinese dream and of the Chinese film industry. Uh, and this is through a wide variety of different ways and strategies. Um, some through th some through financing, some through the exchange of talent. So um, editors are a huge are hugely important. Foreign editors are hugely important in the Chinese film industry, even for films that appear to be entirely Chinese in funding and and um, to have enti entirely Chinese talent. As we saw through efforts like the film The Great Wall, there's still an interest in drawing on foreign talent, though the the outcomes of that are are by no means certain as we also saw from the Great Wall. So there are, there's a lot of uncertainty and a lot of, there are a lot of efforts to kind of build this relationship. And there have also been a lot of failures. So it's, it was very interesting. Over the course of writing this, this project, I would put together, whenever I would read about a new US-China film in Variety, I'd put it on a list. And by, when I was going through to do final proofreading for the book, I went through that list to make sure that there weren't any that had been made that I had missed. And there were, there were I would say, probably five sixths of the films that I had listed that were supposed to be made had not, had not yet been made or had you know, kind of failed or failed to be distributed, even if they were made. So there, there's a huge amount of failure. Now, there's, there's a lot of failure in Hollywood as well. So there are a lot of, a lot of films that get stuck in what's called development hell, um, you know, this point at which there's, there's funding and there's a star attached, and then it doesn't move forward, and then the, the project dies. So some of that is unique to the US-China relationship. Some of that is just unique to Hollywood itself. <laughs> 
Now, at the same time, this is also um, expanding the visual representations of China are important for larger strategic goals uh, like the Belt and Road Initiative. No talk in 2018 about China can, can continue without the Belt and Road Initiative at least being mentioned once. This is the one mention. Um, but expanding kind of the visual presence of, of China's market and of, of, Chinese, of Chinese representation throughout these spaces is important. And global Chinese films are one way to do that. And sometimes that happens in collaboration with Hollywood. Now, we are seeing the growth of Chinese, of Chinese domestic filmmaking and very robust domestic box office. So these are, some of the, these are some of the stars of 2017 in terms of China's domestic box office. We have um, Kung Fu Yoga, which has I, I see some faces like Kung Fu Yoga. What? It's not that bad. <laughs> I, mean, <it's laughs> I, I mean, it's a Jackie Chan film, and it's got some, it's got some liveliness. So don't, don't be too hard on Kung Fu Yoga. Um, but the film, if you'll notice, took in two hundred fifty-four million dollars in the Chinese box office, which is not shabby. Um, but if you look at the U.S. box office. And in some ways, the response in the room to the movie Kung Fu Yoga really was reflective of that. Um, it's $362,000 in terms of theatrical box office. Some of that has to do with the scope of which um, the film was, was distributed and then released. But as I'll be discussing later, now um, Dalian Wanda does, does own the largest film distribution company in, in the US. So there is actually a platform for distribution of these films. Some of it just has to do with, with poor box office and lack of interest in the US market. Similarly, we have the film Wolf Warrior Two, which um, Damien helpfully, um, helpfully mentioned. And that film took in $2.71 million, which is actually quite respectable for a Chinese film in the US box office. However, it is not respectable compared to the amount that the film took in in the Chinese box office of $854 million, which in some ways gives rise to the argument, which I think is in, in many ways a, a correct one, that Chinese filmmakers don't necessarily need a global market. They can, if they have a success domestically, that can just be a success on its own. Um, and there isn't necessarily a, a, a demand or a, a need for, for global films. Now, there are, these, there are tensions, of course. There's the, economic, there's the economic challenge of making a profitable film. But then there's also the cultural, political, and security challenge of making a film that has resonance around the world. And those two goals can sometimes be in tension. So a film like Wolf Warrior II, as I'll, I'll show a trailer in the end of my talk, you'll see in some ways why the film didn't necessarily get an international market. Um, and I would just urge you to keep that in the back of your mind. Um, and then we have a film, uh, and then we have a film like the uh, Journey to the West, a new iteration of, of that narrative um, that took in $239 million in the Chinese market, but only $880,000 in the US market. So while there is this growth of Chinese domestic production, and, and actually, these are, these are the films from the top 10 of um, Chinese film distribution from last year um, that, had the highest, that had the highest box office, but also had foreign um, distribution in, in the US at all. So there are, there were, um, there, there's another film called Never Say Die, which was a, um, a Chinese comedy, which didn't get distribution in the US at all, um, which took in slightly more than that. But it's important to note that even the really popular kind of significant blockbusters in the Chinese domestic market at this point are not yet having global reach. So if, there's, if there remains this priority to build, to build out a strong, um, to build out a strong global film industry for cultural security, for cultural security and economic reasons, then these films don't necessarily fit the bill. If the question is merely just about building up China's film industry in order to have a, a robust domestic market, then China is well on the way toward that. So. This guy is really, in many ways, the patron saint of all US-China collaborations. Kung Fu Yoga was just one of many that he has starred in. And um, he's a highly prolific, uh, Jackie Chan is a highly prolific, um, is a highly prolific actor, but also he's highly prolific in terms of his ability to, to bridge the gap between these two different cultures. So in addition to Kung Fu Yoga, um, the, pre the year previously, he had been, in, he had been involved in the co-production Skip Trace with um, the early 2000s star of Jackass, Johnny Knoxville. Um, I watched some really great stuff, guys. <laughs> I just, <laughs> you should see my Netflix key recommendations. <laughs> it's, um, but, but it really demonstrates the kind of variety of different, of different approach, strategic approaches that, that, um, that 
different companies are taking in order to really engage with the market. So um, most of it is driven by the physicality of martial arts. Um, we are seeing, you know, as well as these kind of narratives of um, epic narratives like we see in the Great Wall. Um, but Jackie Chan has really, if anyone has figured this out, he has. And, and let me show you the different ways in which it's possible to get a film into the Chinese market. So as we discussed, there's the film import quota. So those 34, 34 revenue sharing films, or um, what's called buyout films, which are, um, which are films that are wholly purchased by a Chinese distributor for distribution um, in the Chinese market. There are also pirated films. So there, are cert there are still films that don't get into the Chinese market um, for a variety of different reasons. So for example, Deadpool and Ghostbusters were two that um, would have normally been candidates to enter the market because they're large blockbusters. Uh, but Deadpool, because it was um, because of the language and the, the producers were unwilling to make changes, it didn't receive a Chinese distribution um, date. And then Ghostbusters because of its super supernatural content. Um, that's these are the uh, reported reasons, at least. Now there is also there are also some there are also some contractual agreements. Um, arranged through the State Administration of Press, Publication, Radio, Film, and Television, China's major media regulator. Um, and that's the official form of co-production in China. So co-production is, is an interesting topic in the sense that when, um, when discussed in the US context, it can just be a contractual arrangement. In China, it's a, it's a more complicated process that has to be brokered through the State Administration of Press, Publication, Radio, Film, and Television. So two recent co-productions are um, the film Kung Fu Panda 3, which was was uh, a co-production between uh, Oriental DreamWorks, which was a joint venture between DreamWorks <coughs> Animation and um, several Chinese companies, and um, and then uh, Tibetan Rock Dog, which uh, and and DreamWorks Animation, and then Tibetan Rock Dog, or sorry, Rock Dog, which was originally Tibetan Rock Dog. Um, but the Tibetan part of the rock dog was actually lost in the co-production process. Um, however, you can actually see that the Tibet that the rock dog is wearing um, Tibetan-style clothing, and his name is Dorji, um, D-O-R-J-I, which is a, a Tibetan name. So there, are, so this whole co-production process has a has a variety of different political elements, and as go, and when going through the when going through the process, the state administration of press, publication, radio, film, and television is able to give notes on the production from all the way from the pre-production stage, so just to the generation of an idea, all the way through the distribution process. Now you can imagine um, that this sometimes doesn't work; that sometimes pro like Hollywood producers push back. Um, Co-productions also rely on a certain fixed amount of Chinese funding. So at times during the production process, the amount of Chinese funding changes. So there isn't necessarily enough Chinese funding to, for a film to officially be a co-production. Um, but just to kind of recap, Sino-foreign co-productions are contractual arrangements between a foreign party and a Chinese party to conduct filming. But this has to be, over, this has to be overseen and accredited by the State Administration of Press, Publication, Radio, Film, and Television at each stage of the production process. Now, frequently what happens is this, this co-production process fails. And it leads to something that I call in my book called faux, faux production. Um, so Transformers 4 is a great example of this, a film that started off as an official co-production between China and the US. And then um, for a variety of different reasons, both financial and political, um, the, co film's co the film lost its co-production approval. However, it was ultimately able to distribute, the film was ultimately distributed in the Chinese market. And that those production relationships and the relationships with regulators ultimately facilitated later iterations of the film to be released within the Chinese market. So as you'll note, um, the, the newest version of Transformers is one of the films that really took in a large, uh, that really had a large box office performance in China in 2017. So building relationships for iterative products um, over time is really crucial in terms of being able to really fully leverage the, leverage the value of the market for Hollywood studios. Now, one of the ways that studios have attempted to do this is not just by building up collaborations in films, but actually longer term capital investments. Um, and one way that that happens is something that um, 
that I talk about as brandscapes in my film. That's actually a term that was drawn from Anna Klingman um, in 2007. The important part of this is the idea of demarcating culturally independent sites where corporate value systems materialize onto physical territories. So essentially, where there is a, a space, a physical space, in which it's possible to actually experience and live the corporate IP. Now, Disney has been the most masterful in this. In 2005, they began the Disney English schools. I actually have a clip of someone giving a YouTube self-tour of the Disney English schools, if you want to see it later. Um, but essentially, at that point, Disney was not allowed to, have, to use their typical market entry strategy, which would be to start a cable, company, or to start a cable television company in China. Um, so television is, much more, is regulated in a much more conservative fashion than the film industry is. Um, so instead, they took advantage of Chinese education policy, which was supporting at that point in 2005, pre-Olympics, the growth of English language education in China. So they opened up the Disney English schools. And Disney English schools taught English using Disney IP. Uh, and if you'll note here at the top, it says the Magic Theater. And actually, there are students pay to watch videos about English using Disney characters. So they learn about Disney characters, even if they're not watching them on television. Their parents are actually paying for them to be in that space to learn English and also ultimately learn about Mickey and the brand values. Um, so this is actually a relatively successful strategy. And ultimately, Disney in 2009 received uh, approval to begin building the um, Shanghai Disney Resort, which opened in 2016. And, um, and has, had, has, had some, has had some reasonable success. Now, if you'll note here, um, it's, so if you'll note here, we see the Enchanted Storybook Castle in the foreground of this image. And this was something that was released around the time of the grand opening of Shanghai Disney. Um, it's important to note the Enchanted Storybook Castle, unlike, for example, Cinderella's Castle, is affiliated with no specific Western narratives. Um, it's not Sleeping Beauty's castle. It's not Cinderella's castle. It is merely an enchanted storybook castle. Enchan enchanted storybooks could be from any different country. Um, similarly, Main Street USA was also replaced within the, within the context of, um, of Shanghai Disney. Now, if you'll note here, in the backdrop, there are kind of the, the greatest hits of Shanghai's architectural landscape. Um, and when you look at this image, it appears that there is this kind of Disney corporate imperialism uh, and the leveraging of Disney's and um, Disney's brand overtaking the space of Shanghai, which is a politically kind of which is a politically controversial move, in the sense that Shanghai historically was also uh, also had the semi-colonial period of um, of foreign occupation. The part that's particularly interesting about this, though, is that the the park itself is majority owned not by Disney but by their Chinese partners. So actually, this is a situation in which um, several Chinese real estate companies um, are benefiting from using the Disney brand in order to grow the tourism infrastructure. Um, so it's, it's a complicated dynamic. And frequently, um, what appears to be what appears one way, what appears to be a sort of Hollywood domination, ultimately reveals a, a very different, um, a different power dynamic. Similarly, um, Oriental DreamWorks, which was originally a collaboration between DreamWorks Animation and, um, and, a, and a series of Chinese companies, most notably China Media Capital, um, which has invested in a wide variety of these, uh, of these different ventures, actually um, made Kung Fu Panda 3 and was planning on making a, a series of, of films. But ultimately, um, recently, Oriental or DreamWorks Animation sold part of their stake. Uh, and one could look at this as, a, as also a, a strategy for gathering information, gathering collaborative expertise, and then eventually um, not working with the foreign partner in order to, in order to, advance, domestic, in, in order to advance, advance domestic efforts. Now, that being said, um, as shared media investment increases, though Disney has had some success, um, there, are, there are some potential areas of conflict that we see emerging. So one area that um, it's always important to note is this question of content, so things that are cut out of films. Um, early, uh, early on uh, in Mission Impossible 3, images of Shanghainese people doing laundry were cut out of the film in order for it to be released. The film's release date was delayed by three months, and the film had been pirated so many times that it had almost no box office in China. 
<laughs> you know, you've got to listen to the censors when they, when they say something. World War Z, um, interestingly, was um, initially, um, the initial screenplay had um, a zombie making a zombie making virus that emerged from China, uh, but in order to receive Chinese distribution approval, that, vi that zombie making virus was not from China in the, uh, in the final version. <laughs> One guy, and that's actually pretty legitimate. After in a post SARS environment, I, that's a it's a very legitimate critique. Finally, um, James Bond in Skyfall uh, was shot as Chinese security guard, and that that piece was also um, was also cut out. Now, the part that's been more interesting recently has been um, the ways in which Chinese studio, in which Hollywood studios have in some ways adjusted their material for the Chinese market, not by cutting out things that are offensive, but by adding, but by, in some ways by cutting out things that are offensive, but in other ways by adding things that are exciting or that you know, might promote um, China's interests. So we see in this case uh, Tilda Swinton's character in Doctor Strange in the original source material. Um, her character was supposed to be a Tibetan monk, much like Dorji, the Tibetan rock dog. Um, her identity was shifted in the production process, and instead she was Celtic. Um, similarly, uh, Ben Kingsley's character in uh, Iron Man 3 uh, was, was called the Mandarin. Uh, and one can see very clearly why that might, uh, and he was the, the, main, um, the main enemy of, of Iron Man. One can see why this might not, uh, why, why this not, might not be appealing. Uh, but ultimately, there was a bizarre, a bizarre shift in the character where actually he was Afghani, but actually he was an actor. And the idea of the Mandarin was just some kind of a strange, um, strange anachronism that was never fully explained in the film. Um, now again, in both of these cases, you could easily say that the original source material was highly orientalist, and so I'm not defending the, I'm not defending this idea of a mystical monk or a you know a, a Mandarin as, as Iron Man's you know sworn enemy, uh, but I think it's interesting to see how the how those shifts were being made, and then finally, one of my favorites is um, Arrival, in which the this massive collaboration between the Chinese and the US space programs ultimately was what saved the world from aliens. And in some ways, this is the most, this is seemingly the, the least believable uh, because I live in Washington. And hearing about the challenges in the US Chinese space collaboration and you know, the, the difficulties of actually getting people to sit at the table to talk about those things um, in, track, in track one and track two and track 1.5 dialogues um, makes, in some ways, it more believable that Matt Damon would actually have a ponytail and be fighting uh, <laughs> monsters on the Great Wall. But it really demonstrates this kind of effort to, to build build collaborative relationships where they might not actually exist in order to present a favorable vision of Hollywood, China, Holly, of the US and China for the purposes of film distribution. Now, we're also seeing corporate decision making becoming more entwined. So Dalian Wanda acquired um, Legendary Pictures. Huayi Brothers and STX Entertainment have a slate of film collaborations. Uh, Dalian Wanda also acquired AMC Theaters and Carmike Cinemas. Um, and then uh, recently, Netflix and IHE made, had a content distribution agreement in, in China. Um, now, all of these have had a variety of different challenges along the way. Uh, and Throughout this process, Dalian Wanda really led the way, um, but because of um, because of its own domestic political issues with the Chinese government, has had to scale back a lot of its ambitions. And one of the things that we are seeing, fo particularly following Dalian Wanda's acquisition streak of Legendary and um, AMC and Carmike, is a kind of antipathy from the Chinese government about overseas direct investment into into large Hollywood Hollywood studio properties in lieu of investing domestically. Uh, now, that being said, the Chinese government isn't the only government that's concerned about some of these issues. Uh, the US government has become increasingly interested and increasingly involved in examining Chinese acquisitions of, um, of foreign companies. In particular, and sorry for the quality here, but in particular, um, and this is from a letter in 2016 in this, uh, from the from uh, Republican members of Congress to the Government Accountability Office, it focuses on concerns about Dalian and Wanda's acquisitions um, and potential Chinese acquisitions of entertainment companies in the US and what that might mean. Now, at the time, this was very much a fringe view. But uh, with the current administration, this idea of essentially using um, national security, a national security committee called CFIUS in order to oversee acquisitions by Chinese um, of US 
properties by Chinese firms has really picked up steam and there's a lot more interest in this. So CFIUS is an interagency committee authorized to review transactions that could result in control of a US business by a foreign person. But typically, this has been historically used to deal with issues of nuclear security or the power grid. Uh, so it's really interesting to see it and to, to consider this idea of entertainment being a strategic industry. Now, from the Chinese perspective, entertainment and cultural security are a major issue and have been entwined in this idea of national security. However, this is very distinctive from a US perspective. Um, and, or at least in, in a US perspective, not immediately post-Cold War. Um, so we can think about historical examples where Hollywood has been used and leveraged as a, as a form of, of US um, cultural warfare. Now, in addition to resistance to overseas direct investment, we are seeing increasing constraints within the Chinese market for investment. Um, and so in the digital landscape, there is the 2017 cybersecurity law which restricts um, critical information infrastructure to only be owned by um, Chinese-run joint ventures. Now, what this means in practice, if um, many, many of you may have seen that Apple opened up a new data center in China, um, so this was the result of the critical information law. So any companies that are generating huge amounts of data or storing huge amounts of data could be subject to this critical information infrastructure's law, which would require them to store their data in, the, in a Chinese server. This, I, this and I, I'm, I need to do more research on this um, because it just happened, but I'm, I would be interested to see if this had anything to do with the decision to withdraw from the Oriental DreamWorks joint venture as well um, because of the kind of technology transfer that this type of infra, critical infra, infrastructure law requires. Similarly, in 2016, um, there was the online publishing service management rules, which prohibit co-ventures as well as foreign operated work units or firms um, from online audiovisual publishing. So in many ways, this makes it a lot more difficult for, um, for any kind of digital platforms to operate within the Chinese market without actually uh, without kind of whole, a wholesale collaboration with a Chinese partner. So for example, in the Netflix IGE collaboration, um, it's not a corporate joint venture, it's merely a licensing of Netflix content on the IGE platform, which, is, which provides Netflix with a lot less control and power over, the, um, over its, its role in the Chinese market. And indeed, almost immediately, um, one of its kind of most famous shows, Bojack Horseman, was taken off of the IGE platform as soon as it was released uh, over the summer. Um, we're also seeing shifts in film and kind of a con con increasing constraints in the film industry. So in the March 2017 film promotion law, uh, it urged socialist core values for cast and crew. Um, socialist core values is a, is a phrase that has been used across a variety of different regulatory frameworks. Um, it includes 12 different kind of key values like integrity and um, and no, which aren't problematic in, in themselves. The, the difficulty is the, the relative level of um, subjectivity. So it becomes very easy to allow or disallow certain actors, to, actors and crew to work within the market, which also further constrains co-production activity. So where are we right now? So we have the US-China film agreement currently under negotiation. Increasing antipathy toward Chinese investment in the film industry. Increasing Chinese, frustration, Chinese government frustration with overseas direct investment, and increasing limitations on online publishing and storage in China. So structurally and from a regulatory standpoint, this is a much more difficult, this is a much more difficult landscape than it was five years ago. However, in terms of the actual capital, it's much more lucrative and much more appealing. So while from a structural standpoint, it's much more difficult for Hollywood studios to work within the Chinese market, from a financial standpoint, there's much more incentive. So we're still seeing this movement toward uh, trying to build collaboration. It's just much more, much more difficult. And ultimately, um, if something, and ultimately we see um, films domestically within the Chinese market like this. So when seeing a film like Wolf Warrior 2, it becomes possible to both see the ascendance of Chinese national power and the, the growth of the Chinese film industry. It's something that's, that's really kind of genuinely engaging in, in a way that earlier um, Hollywood films that had this very strong nationalistic tendency are. Um, by the same token, we also see through the film the kind of 
challenging relationship with other countries that the, the film portrays um, and how this film may not appeal broadly to a global market, uh, particularly in um, countries that are um, Belt and Road destinations, like, like in Africa um, or in, in the US context. Uh, but what we'll see is, is this kind of tension between the growth of the Chinese domestic industry and the robust development of, of the Chinese film industry with, the, with, with Hollywood's efforts to kind of continue to leverage the growing Chinese film industry as a way to ensure that it, and it was a way to ensure global Hollywood products have kind of a continued, a continued market share. So with that, um, if you're interested in more, have this book, Hollywood Made in China, um, which I would, I would urge you to pick up. I also have some discount codes in the back and uh, bookmarks if you're interested. Uh, but I'd also, um, I'm also really curious and interested in hearing any of your questions. And I look forward to a rich and, uh, a rich and lively discussion. Thank you so much for your time and attention. Um, I'm aware that uh, there are restrict content restrictions on, mm -hmm. on you know, filming horror films, or you talked about supernatural content. Right. And this is what my question is about. Why uh, Do you have any sense of why it's OK to have Tinkerbell and an enchanted fairy castle and a Celtic monk, but not Ghostbuster ghost? Is it because there's a level of haunting involved, or is there something? No, I mean, it's, it's very subjective. So for example, with a lot of Disney films, uh, when there is, um, you know, when it's very clear that the distribution market will be very robust, then there's some, there's some flexibility there. And a lot of the reason for allowing any Hollywood films into the Chinese market is because China had a massive growth in, the, in terms of its overall theatrical infra infrastructure. So films that would be able to put butts in the seats in those, in those theaters were particularly, excuse me, particularly important, um, especially films that could be released on digital theaters, in digital theaters, because most of the growth of the Chinese theatrical infrastructure was building brand new digital theaters. So films like Disney animated, like Disney animated films or kind of Disney spectacles really leverage that theatrical infrastructure and also put money into the pockets of Chinese distributors. Because the 34 film import quota films get a certain percentage of Chinese, of Chinese funding uh, they also benefit Chinese distributors in addition to benefiting foreign distributors. So particularly successful films um, can, can drive the growth of the Chinese distribution market. Thank you. And if you could just say your name and your major or you know, your background. Hi, I'm Alicia Sams. I'm, uh staff at the IOP. Do you know what the budget levels are like for the Chinese blockbusters? So it, I mean, so Chinese blockbuster is a relatively. Well, like the one that made 865 million, right. or a Jackie Chan. Right, right, right. So they're lower than, um, than Hollywood studio films. They tend, to, they tend to be lower than the $100, $100 million mark, which means that they're more profitable. Um, so a film like. Um, a film like Transformers, like the like Transformers Five, has to have access to the entire global market in order to be able to be in order to be able to re, um, make a return on its investment. Whereas, um, because of the budgetary level at which uh, Wolf Warrior Two was filmed, they only needed the Chinese market and actually were highly profitable for the Chinese market as well. So that's a that's a great question and and really demonstrates the kind of difficulty that Hollywood is in right now. Oh yeah. Hi, thanks so much for speaking. Uh, my name is David. I'm a senior at the University of Chicago in the college. Uh, and my question is about uh, the blackout dates for mm -hmm. uh, films over the summer. And yeah. as you, as I noticed with the trailer for the movie you showed, uh, Wolf Warrior 2, it happened over the summer. Right. And I was wondering, you could maybe speak a bit about that kind of regulation. Do you see that as like a trend continuing? And how does that affect the bottom line for how movies do in China? Right, no, that's, that's an excellent point. So there tend to be, um, there have historically been blackout dates during the summer, as well as during the Chinese New Year period. Any kind of major distribution dates, which also constrains the overall size of the box office for even Hollywood films that receive a distribution approval. Um, so it allows for films like Wolf Warrior to have more unconstrained access to the Chinese market and to take in, to take in more funds. Um, now that being said, in, 20, um, 
in 2016 when the Chinese market softened somewhat. Uh, you'll, you, here, let's see. I can show you. Um, I'll keep talking. But uh, so in 2016, the Chinese market was relatively flat. And at that point, the um, regulators allowed in more films than the 34 film quota. They also allowed films to be released during the, um, uh, that's OK. Um, they also allowed, it was pretty flat. So it was 6.8 billion to 6.8 billion. Um, they also allowed more films to be released during that period of time. So, um, so a lot of it is up to the discretion of the Chinese government. And so there is an incentive to continue to grow the overall size of the market as well, which is another reason why Hollywood studio films are still allowed into the market. I'll be very interested to see once China's market, if it becomes the largest in the world, how the, what the regulatory response will be at that point to Hollywood studio films. Um, if China is able to have a larger market than Hollywood without distributing its um, without without allowing any kind of foreign films in, then there may be you know it may just be like the films that are demanded by the populace, and then everything else doesn't doesn't get in. So it, it, that should be interesting. But the there are a variety of different estimates about when China's market will become the largest in the world. One of them was 2018. That probably won't happen. Um, but some are estimating by 2020, 2022 that that should be the case. So it'll be interesting to see how that develops. But thank you for your question. Uh, as you're talking, I'm reminded of how James Bond movies uh, during the Cold War, as detente developed, led to uh, actually rather collaborative relations between mm -hmm. what could be enemies. And, and the main villain was this private terrorist organization anyway. So I wonder, as um, Chinese leaders talk about a new kind of relationship between great powers, yeah. is does that figure in narratives in any way, like in Wolf Warrior? Uh, and, and how, uh, uh, like, is there like central influence over uh, like movie scripts as well as other kinds of media? That is, that's a great question. Um, so there is central influence over movie scripts in the sense that the state administration of press, publication, radio, film, and television has to give filming approval to all films that are made in China. So that is, so that's kind of a very fundamental, so in addition to co-productions, they have to, they oversee, they oversee film distribution for all films. There's a, a stamp, a, a dragon stamp uh, that is on, that's on all films released in China and that comes from the state administration. Uh, so a fil films without that dragon stamp are considered to be illegally released in the market. Now it's interesting that you bring up this really, this great power relationship because for the most part, we don't necessarily see this new great power relationship of equality being represented in Chinese films. So in the same summer that Wolf Warrior 2 was released, and you all saw the kind of relatively muscular militaristic vision of, of, what, China, of what China looked like in that film, that was actually a, one of the least, one of not the most nationalistic military film that was released in the summer of 2017. Uh, there was the film, The Founding of an Army, which was um, a film celebrating the anniversary of the founding of the Chinese army, which actually was supposed to be the big block breakout army hit of the summer and created some tension for uh, Wang Jing, the director of this film, because his film was outperforming the state-funded film Founding of the Army. So during the press tour for, found, or for uh, Wolf Warrior 2, he had to continuously say, you should see Wolf Warrior 2, but there's also this other great movie <laughs> that you really want to check out <laughs> called Founding of the Army. Um, and the, the box office numbers were much lower for that, for that film, largely because it didn't have the same kind of sensational, um, sensational violence that, that Wolf Warrior 2 did. Any other questions? Ah, yes. Hi, my name's Denny McMahon. I'm a fellow at the uh, Paulson Institute. Um, I was wondering, uh, last year, um, Beijing started putting on pressure, putting pressure on certain companies like Wanda to pull mm. back from certain types of investments overseas, right. specifically things like you know, property and soccer clubs. And I was just wondering whether investment in Hollywood was affected at all, whether it be production companies or anything else. Yeah, no, that's a great question. And actually, um, so there was one really big deal that fell apart Largely, it, was, it has been reported um, as a result of that. So uh, Wanda was in discussions to purchase Dick Clark Productions for a uh, billion dollars. And that deal actually fell through. And 
um, Wang Jianlin had also been talking about purchasing a stake in Paramount, um, particularly with the drama surrounding Sumner Redstone's estate and um, control over control over that um, his his stock holdings. And that talk has has almost completely receded. Um, in fact, uh, Wanda actually sold a stake of their of their film, I believe their film production business to Alibaba um, in the past few weeks. So there has so. It has affected not only Wanda's overall um, investment abroad, but also the financial sol um, the financial solvency of the country or of the company um, in China as well. You reckon, is that a Wanda specific thing, or do you think that's kind of like a touchstone for Chinese companies generally speaking? No, so it's it's affected the over the cool down of overseas direct investment has affected a wide range of different companies. So, for example, the Echo. Um, and LeVision, uh, it's a hardware and production company. They, they have kind of been tanking over the past year, and they had opened up um, offices in LA. And then even with um, kind of friends and colleagues who are involved in, in small level um, distribution and, and independent production, they've been having difficulty just getting funds out of China privately to do, to do much smaller deals. So it's, it's really at all levels of the industry. Um, and it's, it's a significant concern, um, particularly for people involved in the entertainment industry. So, thank you. Uh, just a community, community person. Hi. In Wolf Warrior Two, they had a plot where they were in Africa uh, uh -huh. work. How much of that development is going on in reverse with uh, countries that, that, that China is now working with and building its coalition uh, going forward and using media uh, as a source of cohesion. Oh, excuse me. Yeah, so the, the, are they building infrastructure with those countries that they're working with now, like in that Wolf Warrior plot? Yeah. Are they cultivating uh, media properties there and film development and things like that for the cultural cohesion? Yeah, well, so that is an excellent question. Let me, let me make sure that I'm on the right slide here. We'll stick here. So I think this is really important in the sense that um, there are a wide variety of things that are happening with Chinese investment in Africa. Uh, and I think it's great that you bring up this particular point, because first of all, China has been expanding its state media presence in Africa uh, quite robustly. So one of those ways is um, through CGTN. Some of you may have seen it. There are actually, there's actually CGTN in the US as well. So it's China Global Television Network. It used to be CCTV International. Um, they, have, they have offices in Washington, DC. They may, have, they may have an office here in Chicago. I'm not sure. But they have very, a very strong and robust presence in <coughs> Africa um, in, a, in a variety of different countries, in Ethiopia and Kenya um, and Tanzania. And so from that perspective, China has been essentially exporting um, media infrastructure to countries that really could benefit from it in a lot of ways, but it's exporting a very kind of specific vision of international affairs. Now, at the same time that that's happening, countries like Djibouti are also um, now hosting Chinese um, Chinese military bases. So there's so through the Belt and Road Initiative, this kind of major Chinese infrastructure investment initiative throughout the um, throughout Asia and Africa uh, and the kind of uh, and, the, and the Pacific, there's been a huge emphasis on both infrastructure development and, um, and to a lesser degree, on the development of military logistics services. Now, when speaking, um, I was in Beijing this summer and had the chance to speak with a um, Chinese general who was dealing with the Djibouti question. And, and she was very adamant that it was strictly from a logistical, for a logistical Standpoint, and this was the kind of the main role that this Djibouti base would play. But um, speaking with with other colleagues and friends involved in the military in, in Washington, there are you know a, a strictly logistical military base can be converted quite quickly to something else as well. So it's interesting to see how these how these issues run in parallel: the kind of visual culture, the um, reportage, and then the actual development of infrastructure. Thank you. Yes. Oh, one more question. Yes. Um, do you think the export of soft power from the Chinese government is working right now in the US? Thank you. That's a great. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Uh, because I think I also read something about like Pro Professor David Schember. Uh huh. 
in the George Washington University yeah. saying that like Chinese government is spending over like billions of dollars on this soft power project. So I'm just wondering if in your standpoint it's working or not. Thank you. Yeah. I mean, this is this is a million dollar question. Actually, my one of my colleagues at the Wilson Center, um, named Irene Wu, is doing a project actually measuring soft power, um, because there's this idea of how do we how do we even know what soft power is, and how can we determine if soft power is working if we don't actually know what constitutes soft power. So she's looking at the different vectors of that, um, of encouraging people to study abroad, for example, or of film. Um, film is one aspect of it, but so is tourism, and so is education, and so it's difficult to answer, is soft power working because we have such kind of broad definitions of this term? Um, but I think one way to answer your question is, for example, in the context of this presentation, are Chinese films gathering a large global audience? And the answer to that would be no. Is CGTN successful as a news network in the US? Not yet. Maybe it will be. Um, it has had more success in places like Latin America and Africa. So I think a lot of I think a lot of this is very context specific. So how successful is Chinese soft uh, Chinese soft power efforts as we may define them in the U.S. context versus in other countries? Um, and so from so from strictly the motion picture distribution standpoint, we can say that thus far Chinese soft power has not yet made significant inroads into the U.S. But we're also seeing the growth of Chinese investment in a wide variety of other sectors, also in the education sector. Um, and that's, that's, that's an area that I think is, is quite interesting. And there's a lot of research being done there. So thank you very much for your question. And thank you all very much for your time and attention. It's been really wonderful.